Calls for more updates on Panda Family as strong interest continues. The ICAC holds open day to commemorate 50th anniversary. Former Thai Prime Minister is pardoned by King two days after his daughter was set to become new Prime Minister. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The newly born panda cubs at Ocean Park are not only bundles of joy for their mother Ying Ying, but also many Hong Kong citizens. To promote the panda economy, a lawmaker has called on Ocean Park to update the panda family's latest situation more regularly for fans locally and worldwide. Home to the very first Hong Kong panda babies, born early Thursday morning, Ocean Park did not buy their time in building the online fan base for the first-time panda mom Ying Ying and her twin cubs. Dedicated pages on social media such as Instagram and Xiao Hong Shu with daily uploads on the panda family's latest activities. Follower numbers have racked up to six digits within two days. This citizen is looking forward to seeing the panda babies grow up. This woman hopes there could be more panda-related merchandise and marketing efforts, such as plushies, so more people could get to know the Hong Kong panda family. But live streaming platforms on the mainland even allow fans to check in on some panda celebrities 24-7 with chat rooms for panda aficionados to interact. That also fostered the panda economy. Lawmaker Chen Yong said many citizens have been very curious about the two newborns' condition and called on Ocean Park to do more to draw more tourists through the panda family. Ocean Park said the health conditions of the twin cubs, a female and a male, over the coming few days will be key to their survival, and they will likely be ready to meet the public in around a few months. Li Sheng, Deputy Director of the China Conservation and Research Center for the Giant Panda said, help from human experts is all the more important to ensure both cubs can be breastfed properly from Ying Ying, especially when Ying Ying is the world's oldest first-time panda mom. Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Sports Institute Tony Choi said the body will review the direct subsidy plans for local athletes next month. This comes after some athletes raised concerns over the lack of financial support during the Paris Games. The institute now offers a six-tiered subsidy scheme. Athletes under the highest level, including medalists at the Olympics or world-class competitions, receive $44,500 a month. Those at the lowest tier receive only $7,130. Speaking with RTHK, Tony Choi said the money was not salaries but stipends for apprentices. And these young athletes are given coaching support, accommodation and meals as an overall package, Choi said. He also denied that limited subsidies had led to athletes dropping out. He said athletes usually are promoted to a higher tier every two to three years. A resident in Fanling has been confirmed to be infected with dengue fever. It is suspected to be a locally transmitted case. The 69-year-old male patient resides in Ka Phuc Estate. The Center for Health Protection and the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department held health talks in the neighborhood with free tests on dengue fever. Some district counselors said the number of mosquitoes declined in recent months, but authorities should do more education work to teach residents about mosquito control and personal protective measures. The CHP reminds anyone displaying dengue fever symptoms should call their hotline for testing. Today is the first of several open days to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Independent Commission Against Corruption. The ICAC hopes more people can be aware of their work. Three more open days will be held, including tomorrow and next weekend. Mimosang I reports. On Saturday morning, many residents arrived at the ICAC headquarters in North Point for the first open day of the year. Visitors were divided into groups and led by staff members to visit selected facilities of the anti-corruption agency, including this video interview room. This is where ICAC officers meet suspects and ask them questions. During the interview process, officers will record their conversations with the suspects. To avoid disputes when a case goes to court, a high-resolution camera is installed on the ceiling of each video interview room to capture documents or digital devices displayed to a suspect. 
an action scene was performed for the visitors, showing how officers would arrest armed suspects in an operation. <laughs> Models of firearms from different eras used by ICAC officers are showcased to the public. Visitors can also test out the firearms. For instance, this model of Smith & Wesson revolver is a first-generation firearm used by the ICAC. ICAC said they had received more than 19,000 applications for the four open days. In the end, about 6,000 applicants could visit the headquarters. We hope that we can convey the message that the ICAC is committed to fighting corruption in Hong Kong for the past five decades. And we also hope to take this opportunity to introduce to them the latest development of the ICAC. Some residents brought their children to the open day for educational purpose. Today is a very good uh, opportunity for us uh, to learn more about ICAC and also uh, to allow his interest to, uh, to know more the, the government's uh, department. The first part of the tour, because there are lots of the cases. What is the corruption? What, what action did they do? Real case, real information for the children to study. To commemorate its 50th anniversary, the Anti-Corruption Agency set up an exhibition showing past TV drama series featuring the ICAC. Means 9, TV News. The Leisure and Cultural Services Department has started a trial scheme for lifeguards to work overtime to address manpower shortage issues. This after some public swimming pools were forced to close temporarily owing to a lack of lifeguards. The trial follows an earlier proposal by the Hong Kong Government Lifeguards General Union. Under it, current lifeguards who are willing to work overtime receive an hourly rate of more than $100, and they work one to three extra hours every day, capped at 11.5 hours a day. The maximum weekly working hours locked would be 69 hours. Thailand's former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat was today included in a royal pardon for prisoners. This means his parole will end tomorrow. On Friday, the Thai parliament voted for his daughter, Pei Tong Tarn, to become the country's prime minister. Thaksin's parole had been due to finish at the end of the month. The earlier finish comes as part of the general royal pardon for prisoners with good conduct on the occasion of King Maha Longkorn's birthday last month. Thaksin returned to Thailand from self-exile last year and went straight to prison on corruption charges. In the U.S., Vice President Kamala Harris announced a sweeping set of economic proposals to cut taxes and lower the cost of groceries, housing and other essentials for many Americans. But her rival Donald Trump said her policies will turn the U.S. into a Soviet-style economy. Nasri Kareem with more. Earlier this month, U.S. presidential candidate Kamala Harris was mocked on social media after offering a shallow and vague answer to her plans for the economy. On Friday, the vice president outlined a more detailed vision during a dress and rally in the battleground state of North Carolina, usually a Republican stronghold. The presumptive Democratic nominee said she wants to tackle rising food prices and create an environment for affordable housing, targeting mainly the middle class in what she calls an opportunity economy. She wants to clamp down on price gouging when prices are raised sharply during harsh times, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. As president of the United States, it will be my intention to build on the foundation of this progress. Still, we know that many Americans don't yet feel that progress in their daily lives. Costs are still too high. As president, I will be laser focused on creating opportunities for the middle class that advance their economic security, stability, and dignity. Together, we will build what I call an opportunity economy. Proposals include a federal ban on price gouging on food, rent, petrol, clothes, and prescription medicines. In addition, $25,000 in down payment assistance for first-time house buyers, new tax breaks and child tax credit of up to $3,600, and $6,000 for children under one year old. Many of her plans would need congressional approval. Harris did not miss the chance to take a dig at her Republican rival for the presidency, Donald Trump, who she says wants to tax everything. Now compare what Donald Trump plans to do. He wants to impose what is, in effect, 
a national sales tax on everyday products and basic necessities that we import from other countries. That will devastate Americans. It will mean higher prices on just about every one of your daily needs. A Trump tax on gas, a Trump tax on food, a Trump tax on clothing. The Trump campaign responded promptly to House's speech, saying she wants to turn the U.S. into a socialist country. Trump himself posted on his social media account that Kamala will implement Soviet-style price controls. Nazri Karim, TVB News. And still ahead. United Nations call for urgent ceasefire in Gaza in order to vaccinate children against the threat of polio. Ukraine destroyed a key bridge in Russia during counteroffensive. Welcome back. Around the same time U.S. President Biden was expressing his optimism about the latest ceasefire talks between Hamas and Israel, an Israeli strike was hitting central Gaza, killing at least 15. Peace talks continue with the U.N. asking both sides for a pause for an outbreak of polio in refugee camps. David Garrett reports. The talking goes on, but so does the bombing. Flames and smoke rising overnight in Azawaida in central Gaza. The strike blew up a house and a warehouse. The injured were rushed to hospital. Earlier, Israel ordered people to leave nearby areas as they continue to hunt down Hamas. The evacuation orders are in places previously designated as humanitarian safe zones. At least nine children were among the dead. US President Joe Biden is involved in ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas and says there is a real chance this could stop soon. One of the reasons why I was late for you all was I was dealing with the ceasefire effort in the Middle East. And uh, we are closer than we've ever been. I don't want to jinx anything, but uh, as my grandfather said, with the grace of God, good little neighbors, a lot of luck, uh, we may have something. Later, Biden said he was optimistic about the process, not giving a time frame. He warned all sides not to undermine the process. Egyptian mediators are at the centre of those talks too. The foreign minister knows they are close to a deal which could quell tensions in the entire region. Egypt, Qatar and the United States are making huge efforts to reach an immediate ceasefire, Bada Abdelati said. A cessation of killing civilians and an exchange of prisoners are key to preventing a regional all-out war. The United Nations say a ceasefire of at least a week is a must with the potentially fatal and paralyzing disease polio discovered in wastewater. The virus mostly strikes children under five and has not been seen in Gaza for more than two decades. This man shows us his baby's feet saying, can you see the rashes on my child? They are from the camp. We have large bugs inside the tent because of the lack of clean water. Antonio Gutierrez said the UN and WHO are poised to launch a vaccination campaign for hundreds of thousands of children under 10. I am appealing to all parties to provide concrete assurances right away, guaranteeing humanitarian pauses for the campaign. A polio pause is a must. It is impossible to conduct a polio vaccination campaign with war raging all over. In Yemen, these demonstrators also want an end to the war in Gaza. The Houthi organized gathering saw people shouting anti Israel slogans. David Garrett, TVB New. Ten people were killed and three injured in an Israeli airstrike on the residential building, which was targeting Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. The factory in an industrial area was hit. People said their neighbors, including women and children, were dead in what witnesses said is a civilian area. Hezbollah and Israel have traded strikes since October. Hezbollah says it will stop its attacks on northern Israel if there is a Gaza ceasefire. The fighting has killed 500 people, including 100 civilians in Lebanon. 22 Israeli soldiers and 25 civilians have died. As Ukraine continues its counterattack against Russia, a Ukrainian forces video shows the destruction of a large Russian bridge using Western rockets. The footage shows a strike on what is said to be a strategically important bridge in the Kursk region of Russia. 
Russian and Ukrainian media had earlier reported a strike on the same river bridge. The bridge was reportedly used for delivering equipment to the front line. A historic Independence Day ceremony for Indonesia today. For the first time, the celebrations took place in the archipelago's new but unfinished capital, Nusantara. Described as the world's most rapidly sinking city because of uncontrolled groundwater extraction and the rise of sea level as a result of climate change. Officials say Nusantara will be a futuristic green city with abundant forests powered by renewable energy sources. But the project has been dogged by criticism over environmental degradation, threats to endangered animals and the displacement of indigenous people. Another concern, heavy reliance on private sector investment. Widodo, who will leave office in October, offered incentives to private investors, including land rights lasting up to 190 years. A brawl broke out in Turkey's parliament during a debate on a jailed colleague who hopes to be released and take his seat in the House. Insults were thrown at first and then politicians traded punches. Elected officials rushed from all sides of the House either to get involved or try to break up the fracas. And the Grand National Assembly was debating the case of Chan Atale, who was elected as a parliamentary deputy but remains in prison. Atale represented the Workers' Party in last year's election. Ahmed Sig from the same party as the jail deputy appeared to be attacked by a lawmaker from President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's ruling party. Singh had just called members of the ruling party a terrorist organization. Thousands of people, including doctors, marched through a number of Indian cities on Friday to protest the rape and murder of a trainee doctor at a government hospital, demanding justice and better security at medical campuses and hospitals. Police discovered the bloody body of the 31-year-old victim at the seminar hall of a state-run medical facility in Kolkata. Here we don't have facilities to stay, to sit. We don't have washroom differently for girls. Uh, basically, we don't have doctor's duty room different for females. It's a common, everybody can use it, patients use it. So we basically demand our own uh, waiting rooms, restrooms at least. An autopsy later confirmed sexual assault and a police volunteer was detained in connection with the crime. The family of the victim alleged it was a case of gang rape and more people were involved. In the days since, mounting anger has boiled over into nationwide outrage. The protests have also led thousands of doctors and paramedics to walk out of some public hospitals across India and demand a safer working environment. And that's the news. Thank you for watching.